two very curious things about uh, Sir Harry Croteau, Nobel Prize winner for chemistry, 1996. Uh, the first is uh, he wanted to be a graphic artist, and uh, his father, another father, said you should have a proper job, and, and it turned out he was good at it. So, so that's how his career got started. And the, se the second is. Uh, um, well, I hope this isn't too indulgent, but you remember yesterday I told you about uh, Znaimer and how it was derived from Znoimo and, uh, and that the people who left Znoimo became Znoimers. Um, uh, Harry Kroto's family came from Krotoshin and his, uh, his name, his family's name was Krotoshiner, not far from Znaimer. So, uh, his dad also shortened it to Croto, and uh, Harry spent his life explaining to people that he's not Japanese. Not very uh, successfully, though. Um, I'm going to try and take you through a few aspects of science and uh, the arts, um, the way that I see it. And uh, I always start with this one, because I think many of us had this when we were kids, and one child who shall be nameless, so he always picked the round one up and pushed it through the... Well, no, he picked the cube up and put that through the round hole. The round one, he put that through the round hole. It didn't matter what, which, whatever shape it was, he always had a fixation on the round hole. And since mum decided if he went on like this, he wouldn't get to the University of Toronto. Uh, and uh, so she turned to see a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist said, well, very simple analysis for this kid. Any problem he sees, he only sees one solution. So don't worry, because there's a perfect career for a kid like that, and that's to be a politician. <laughs> Mrs. Bush. OK, now then. But it is rather interesting that shapes and patterns and analysis and go hand in hand, and a, a sort of admiration of beauty, of symmetry, and science go hand in hand when we're young. And if you look at these objects, they're from Scotland. They're 2,000 years old, and they have the platonic symmetries. And in fact, they were found at the site of the first Glasgow Rangers versus Celtic football match. In those days, they used to carve the rocks into nice shapes before they chucked them at the opposition spectators. <laughs> the first chemistry book, if you, some of you may have read it, uh, is by Plato. And it says, in the first place, it is clear to everyone that fire, earth, water, and air are bodies, and all bodies are solids, and all solids, again, are bounded by surfaces, and all rectilinear surfaces are composed of triangles. And on the basis of that, the Greeks had a periodic table with four elements at first, air, fire, earth, and water, and then a fifth element, the dodecahedron, or a fifth structure, was discovered. And so they had five elements in their periodic table. And this actually, although it's simple now, we have a large number of elements, 92 and even more than that, over 100, um, but it's actually a deep understanding of the way that nature works, beauty of symmetry and a beauty in nature. Now, um, let me go back because uh, I want us to do a bit about chemistry, to give you a feeling for what a chemist likes. And this is one of my favorite molecules, and uh, I love it. Uh, but this is the, the formula of it, and I can see that. And I can see also a shape. I don't know what you see. What do you see in that? Any? Can you get a feeling for what it might be? A dog. A dog. Yeah, it's a dog. It's Harry's dog. It's my dog. And if we look at that, it has two carbon atoms, okay, three hydrogen atoms stuck on the end, okay, two hydrogen atoms at the front, and so we've got a dog with a tail, hydrogen tail, and four hydrogen legs, and nitrogen, and an oxygen. And in fact, it's... Um, it's, uh, it's a heart stimulant when I worked on it. And um, I, in fact, I worked on it in, at NRC in Ottawa. And um, it was thought to be an aphrodisiac. And three, four of us all had children at, at, the, at the same time. And so I was blamed <laughs> for this. But anyway, uh, from the rear, it looks like that. And after a night on the tiles, it looks like that. And if it sees a lamppost, we get what's called internal <laughs> rotation. And I want to give you a feel that scientists actually see these objects, and they can look in the abstract world, and they see them as real systems. 
but as Magritte would say, sine prasa in molecule. But I don't know whether the, you know, I never learned uh, really the tenses in French, but that's as good as I can get. Okay, and as good as you need. Um, the basic underlying principles of chemistry are very simple. And everybody should understand chemistry because that is what life is about. Every single person is a test tube with a fantastic range of interrelated chemical reactions going on. If you don't understand chemistry, you do not understand yourself. Okay? The basis of genetics is chemistry. The basis of materials is chemistry. The basis of computers is beautiful chemistry. And chemistry is very easy. It's as easy as one, two, three, or actually not one, two, three. And I'm going to do it in 30 seconds for you. Newton invented classical mechanics to explain how the planets go around the sun. And basically, we had the same picture, that the electron goes around the nucleus. And so the question is, how can you understand? Well, quantum mechanics is the way. If you really want to know what the greatest intellectual advance of the 20th century is, in my humble opinion, it's quantum mechanics. Van Fleck is a famous and the anomalous sun is I, and he makes this statement, practically everyone knows that the components of total angular momentum of a molecule relative to x, y, z fixed in space satisfy this commutational relationship. Well, when I arrived at Toronto Airport last night, I asked a number of people how many <laughs> of the universe. Not a single one did. But basically, that is the equation which governs angular momentum. If you want to know about the Earth going round, the sun, if you want to know how the electron moves around the nucleus, if you want to understand chemistry, you have to know this equation. It's a beautiful equation, and it's based on quantization, and there are what we'll call J. Just think about the numbers, not one, two, three, and I'm going to have orientations, so if it's one, it can actually have several orientations, but in the case of one, it goes from sideways and down. So. There are actually two J plus one orientations. So if you have the number one, you have, you have the number three. If you have the number zero, two J plus one is one. You go back, when J is two, two J plus one is five, okay? So now I'm going to put some boxes and simplify things because we want to throw the numbers away. And here we have numbers one, three, and five. Those are not too difficult. Let's double them up because it turns out there are two electrons to each box. Put the boxes together, move them around double up those on the left, put another two there, another two there, move them around to here, and what have we got? We've got the periodic table. The periodic table is based on the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, it's as simple as that. Deep under the whole of your life, the whole of your chemistry, everything that goes on are the numbers quantized. And it's as simple as that. In fact, on the basic periodic table, we know the whole of, understand fundamentals of chemistry. We don't know it all. We don't know what to do with the future is fantastic, so I will show you but we understand essentially all of chemistry and all the useful physics as well. The reason I'm here as a Nobel Prize winner is that my colleagues and I discovered a molecule, C60 Buckminster Fuller. It's a beautiful molecule, has the structure of a soccer ball. <laughs> but the soccer ball is really quite interesting because it turns out that the ratio of the size of the soccer ball to the Earth is the same ratio as the size of the C60 molecule. Again, is the ratio of the Earth to the soccer ball, to the soccer ball, to the diameter of this tube. These tubes are strong enough so that if you had a bundle of them, they would be a hundred times stronger than steel and one-sixth the weight. Those crashes would not occur if we can control those. We heard in the first talk. We would have airplanes that if the engines failed, they would just glide. They would be so light and so strong. We'd have bridges that wouldn't fall down in earthquakes. We'd have skyscrapers also very, very strong. That's what this molecule, these molecules, uh, promise in the future. We can make helical structures like this. We don't know how to control that. This is a triple helix, which we discovered in one of our research projects. Molecular machines are on the way. This is inside your body. This is hemoglobin. As you are breathing in, it is moving. We can make machines now, molecular machines, in the future. I can't, haven't got the time to talk about that. As far as art is concerned, that is one of our images, and I think it's really quite a beautiful one. But art and science go hand in hand. Here is Leonardo's drawing of the soccer ball. No wonder the Italians are good at soccer. 
This is a Californian artist picture of one of these beautiful structures, which links rather nicely with the last talk. This is are some nanostructures that we found. We haven't got uses for them yet. Well, we did have a use for this because we used this as the Christmas card for my group last year. Uh, we, this, is this, this is this year's Christmas card as well. And they're very, very beautiful images. If you can't, they are absolutely stunning images. And this is the picture I showed you at the beginning. And in fact, uh, this was really known before because here's an image which uh, you, you may have seen before because it's by Jackson Pollock. And in fact, you would have to pay a million dollars for that one. We'll, we'll, you can have one of ours for a hundred. All right, anytime. Okay, so what are the problems? The problem that I suspect many of us here have is that how many of you um, understand mathematics? Not many. How many of you are frightened of mathematics? A large number. Well, the problem is, as much as anything, the science and the media. This is the image. In fact, this was supposed to be me because the local newspaper, when we discovered the C60, couldn't find a photograph of me, so this they picked it out of the corner. Of course, every scientist looks the same. He looks mad, okay, bald, has a white jacket on and pens stuck in here. And uh, I put it up on the notice board and I put, a student wrote, fantastic likeness, Harry, on the side of it. I, I made him do an extra year for his PhD for, for, for uh, <laughs> But here's the problem. Can scientists shake off their mad media image? And where does it come from? Where does it come from? Well, here's the picture, and I know who the culprit is. Now, some of you may think you know who this person is or what he did. Anybody know? Suggestions, please? Albert Einstein. Yes, and does anybody know, think they know anything, anything that he ever did? Theory of relativity. Well, I have a major surprise for you. This is not the person who created that beautiful theory of relativity. This is, guy is an imposter. The person who did it is this guy. And I think it's about time everybody, including the media, and Steven Spielberg and all these other people who keep propagating these lunatic ideas of what scientists are, because I think they're doing great damage to our children, because they don't want to look like one of these mad guys. Einstein that we saw before was way, way past it. He was 17, 18, 19, 24, whilst he was discovering and thinking about these beautiful theories. And I think he looked then a lot better than this guy. <laughs> And this guy's a Scientologist. Uh, for, uh, <laughs> now, there's a big mistake in that, because we know, people know lots of things about how we can come to and understand ourselves, but you don't have to base it on crazy theories like that. Well, let me go on, because uh, I set up with my colleagues the Vega Science Trust, and um, we're trying to do something um, for the world. I think an understanding of science and technology, because science and technology is, are the dominant cultures of this century, of the next one. That's a fact. Here we're surrounded by technology. It's the technology that allows us to enjoy ourselves. Science and technology have freed everyone in this room from the slavery of working 12 hours a day, seven days a week to actually enjoy life. Okay, in the 16th, 17th century, 95% of you were just struggling to survive. And unless we understand it well, we're not gonna actually survive another century. The first revolution in education was the printing press, in my opinion. Um, until then, monks wrote the only book, and the only book to read was the Bible. So it's the first revolution, the democratization of education. You could write a book and you could get to read it. The second one, I believe, is the internet. You can make a program. We've seen already just before me. That's a program that was not possible before the internet. You can tune into it. You can, you, I mean, even if you want to just take a picture of your kids and your mother in Australia can see it on the internet, all that's possible. Until now, the media have been in total control of broadcasting. Yes, you can read, and something better at reading. 
And then you say, well, no one's going to watch your program. And I know what's happened, you know, like this guy in, I don't know, St. Petersburg or Moscow said, yeah, Fyodor Dostoevsky, no one's going to read this book by these two brothers. Of course they're going to read it. The best material is going to get out there and is going to say, the crap is going to have a certain level and some of it, hopefully all of it, will gradually go away. The aim is to have a platform for scientists and technologists and engineers to communicate directly. Up till now, most of the science that you've got has been communicated to you by the media and people who do not understand the science. Can you believe it? Would you put in charge of your opera houses people who can't hear? Would you put people in charge of your uh, films, people who can't see? We're reinterpreting it for people who can't see. That's the situation that science and technology is in. And it's a problem, a serious problem today. We're pioneering a new concept. We actually have debates, and we have people who understand the subject. I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, new, because by and large on television, what they want is confrontation. They want good television. They don't want a discussion of the issues. And that's one of the big problems because it takes a lot of hard work to do that. Well, let me show you a couple of the problems that confront science and technology. And the power of the internet, because I got this by email. Okay, welcome back. We're ready to resume our discussion of the 105th Congress during your visit here for inauguration. And uh, we're very pleased to have with us the Senate Majority Leader, Trent Lott of Mississippi, if you'd help us welcome. Thank, Thank you, you. Senator. Good morning. I would like to know what advice would you give to a prospective student who is interested in following a career path similar to a senator? Similar to a senator? Yes. Well, first of all, I want to encourage you to take the maximum advantage of your educational opportunities. Uh, we live in a great country, and we have a, a great educational system that's not perfect. Uh, we spend an awful lot of money that doesn't always give us the results that we want. But I can assure you, whatever you want to do in life, uh, education will help you get a faster start. For instance, um, when I was in high school, if you were in the so-called pre-college uh, curriculum, you had to take four years of science and four years of math. A waste of my time, a waste of the teacher's time, and a waste of space. You know, I, I took physics. For what? Uh-oh, <laughs> uh every physics teacher in America is out to lynch me. Physics is great, and I think we need the best possible physics teachers and the best uh, students in physics we can get if you're going into physics or mathematics or science or medicine. But if you want to be a lawyer, and you know that's where you're headed, maybe you'd be better off taking an economics course, a typing course, a computer course, or music, for heaven's sake, because it's good for the soul. Uh, <laughs> Now, I want you to look at this fool <laughs> because he's dangerous because he's giving your children the mandate to know nothing about the basics that underpin the driving force of society. And that is why politicians like this guy make mistakes. How can he understand the problems of AIDS and BSE and genetic modification? You have to rely on somebody else. And I think what is most dispiriting was the reaction of the kids who were cheering this. He'd done this before. He milked the audience. And I was here in Ottawa last year. And maybe I believe that's the reason I'm here today. Because a young woman stood up in the audience and said, basically to me, and I was sitting next to Cardinal, fantastic architect. And Pinker Zuckerman was, uh, had played violin, and I was trying to link, as this particular conference from the National Research Council, and I was a postdoc at NRC, to link the arts and sciences. And she said, Don, you, aren't you missing the point? As science and technology reveals more and more of the way the world works, it destroys the mystery and beauty of art and the, oh, nature. And, the and, I, and the audience clapped, and I asked the audience, why did you why did you applaud? Does it mean that ignorance of the beauty and that underlies the way nature 
and science and technology to work? Is good? What is the reason? What is the reason? When you look at the fantastically beautiful structures which are involved in photosynthesis, they are a map of the flower itself. There's a beauty underlying that, and there's a beauty in the equations. It adds tremendously to all these things. Well, I can't give you any more, I just don't have the time, but after one of our talk programs on GM foods, save question mark, Lord Jenkin, Chairman of the House of Lords Select Committee said, I watched with complete fascination. It was by far the best discussion of the issues that I've ever seen or heard. And in fact, it wasn't shown. Uh, it's, we're trying to get it shown from our website, but we're still working on that. We've actually made some programs, discussion programs with the Open University, which were shown on late night television in the UK. Financial Science Times said the most enthralling program I saw on television last week. I, in fact, I have seen nothing so fascinating for months was called the next big thing, nanotechnology. So there are people out there who want to understand these things. We've got science discussion programs, scientific lectures, a day in the life of a young scientist. What is it like to be a design engineer with a Formula One racing team? Okay. To, des to solve a problem that occurred on the Saturday overnight, get the suspension right, and Michael Schumacher can go to sleep behind the wheel and still win. All right. The hero is not this guy just because he can do that, because he's a fantastic driver, but the people who've engineered that car, there are young designers and engineers who are also heroes in this. The Science Archive, the fantastic scientists, there's a fantastic archive of scientists and technologists and engineers, as there are on the arts as well. And we're also doing workshops for young children. If you click on this website, www.vega.org.uk, you can get some material. And that's our team. Um, let me go on because I want to just get out of that and then get out of that because the workshops are things, things that I'm going to concentrate on in the future. This is Hispanic kids in UCSB. And we've just been experimenting using the internet so I can do a workshop with kids in the studio and beam it to a, a school in Guadalupe 50 miles away. And next year we'll be doing it to half a dozen. And in November I'll be doing it to 3,000 kids in Japan and in Mexico and other places. Meccano, how many had Meccano? Oh, some of you had Meccano. Well, let me tell you something about Meccano. It's a 90% of all scientists, and I think almost 100% of all British engineers had Meccano. And in fact, the demise of British engineering follows exactly the demise of Meccano. It was designed in 1901 by Frank Hornby, and I used to put my nose in front of this shop in Manchester when I was a kid and look at the locomotive. There was talk about this locomotive. I remember coming to Montreal and seeing this fantastic steam lo locomotive. We just got off the boat and we're going to take the train to Ottawa. They were absolutely stunning. We don't have those fantastic things today, and I want to see that train. Well, this is advertising those days. Meccano boys and girls, I better put that in. Uh, and there we have it, advertising is different. No boy or girl who follows the Meccano hobby can be a bad boy. <laughs> this is what we made, okay? Things of this, that actually worked. The real engineering equipment, toys. Then, unfortunately, Lego came along. How many of you had Lego? Yeah, right, that was the problem because that does not teach you engineering, it doesn't put, tell, teach you about a uh, nut and bolt together. That's the problem. This is what you can make. And in fact, no doubt our readers will find several possible uses for this uh, novel sphere, but we do not consider that it would form a very suitable football, but in fact it is the soccer ball structure. Well, I want to finish off. Geodesic domes. This is the geodesic dome in Montreal that I visited in 1967. And in fact, it, this takes a while. I, I, I'd like to show you this because I think there's one thing that I really want to hope that will be changed. Um, unfortunately, this picture takes a long time for my old computer to actually regurgitate. One problem is that um, this geodesic drum designed by Buckminster Fuller was really a very important uh, clue to the structure of our molecule C60. Had the same structure uh, as the soccer ball. 
And you probably don't realize it. If a soccer ball doesn't have just hexagons, it has pentagons as well. Wow, it is taking longer than I expected. It must be, ah, oh, there it is. This beautiful structure, which is out of graphics. Okay, okay. I was trying to solve that earlier. Okay. Um, anyway, the, ah, oh, well, there you go. Uh, okay, let me go on because I want, I'll just go out of that. I was going to show you the burning, the, the, the Montreal Dome burned down. I think it looks terrible today without the windows. It somehow one should get the plastic. But anyway, to go back to the kids' workshop, there are schools art science project that link the arts with the sciences. And here these kids made these sculptures in the ground. Language, the final thing. Uh, I'd like to show you one thing about language that's really quite important. Um, and that is that uh, um, perhaps we should understand this. Uh, at a Faraday meeting in Birmingham on the study of fast reactions, the German scientist Manfred Eigen asked the Oxford Don Ronnie Bell how the English language would describe reactions which were faster than fast. Ronnie Bell replied, damn fast reactions, Manfred. And if they get faster than that, the English language will not fail. You can call them damn fast reactions indeed. <laughs> Now then we get onto some other language. Some of you probably don't know, but uh, this is an equation that a colleague of mine put into a paper and it was turned down. And how many of you recognize this equation? Very small number, just a small. It's, it's actually calculus. Now, if you really want to know one of the major advances of the 18th centuries, it was calculus. I, but I won't tell you this, but I, well, I will, because there'll be two people probably myself and some one other person who can understand this. So he, he was turned down, he said, why is it turned down? I said, it's too complicated. <laughs> and he said, well, he said, well, what do I have to do to get it? Bob, he says, well, you have to simplify it by cross multiplying the Ds. <laughs> the reason it's serious is this. Senior nurses discuss the problem stemming from nurses' inability to do simple maths. They put the decimal point in the wrong place, so patients might receive 10 times too much or 10 times too little medication. I wish Trent Lott was in a hospital with a nurse who couldn't put the decimal point in the right place. He would be worried. A friend of mine, in fact, was in such a place. A colleague, while in hospital, overheard one nurse ask another how many milliliters there were in a microliter. He said, fortunately, she was not attending to him. This is the most important graph I've ever seen. It plots the ultimate proficiency in English of immigrants to the USA, non-English speaking. We find that after the age of three to seven, it drops. In some cases, at the age of three, it's too late for language to be totally proficient. That's a very important thing. And language is the one thing that we're all experts at assessing whether someone is proficient in our own language. Yeah, nothing else, essentially nothing else. And I suggest, we might think about it, that every ability follows the same curve. If it's true, then we have a problem in our teaching because a lot of things aren't taught before the age of 10. Okay, let me get a finish off. No problem with kids to do mathematics. I, I do this with six, seven, or eight-year-olds. I can't go into it. Science and politicians. Well, what about politicians? Here's a, a good example. The House of Lords discussed Buckminster Fullery in science and in industry. That was the level of debate, which I think it was, it was easier to understand this way than it was if you listen to it. Baroness, here, my lords, forgive my ignorance, but can the noble lords say whether this thing is animal, vegetable, or mineral? <laughs> this, didn't know what a molecule was. My lords, I'm glad the noble baroness asked that question. I can say that Buckminster fluorine is a molecule composed of 60 carbon atoms, known to chemists as C60. Those atoms form a closed cage made of 12 pentagons and 20 hexagons that fit together like the surface of a football. Lord Renton. My lords, is the shape of a rugger football or a soccer football? <laughs> They looked around, they couldn't find the answer. There was no one in the audience who knew what, which one it was until they heard the sound of the chandeliers. And they looked up, and there was the one guy who knew. <laughs> now, I want to show you this picture because I love it. It's my favorite photograph from the whole of nature. The humanity in this orangutan is 
space is wonderful. And what's more, the greatest discovery of our time is that we share the DNA. In fact, our DNA is less than 1% different from this guy. Okay? I think that's one of the greatest things, that we are the same as nature. But don't worry, you're 10% different from the guys in the House of Lords, so you're all right. <laughs> uh, okay, let me finish off. I won't go that. I, I've got, this is my penultimate slide. I like it because I, uh, it sums up the way I feel and the way that scientists who understand nature as well as anybody else, I think. I am an alien creature. I was sent from another planet with a message of goodwill from my people. The message says, dear Earth people, when you finally at last destroy your planet and have no place to live, you can come live with us. And we will teach you how to live in peace and harmony and we will give you a coupon good for 10% off all deep dish pizzas too. <laughs> Sincerely, Bob. <laughs> now the reason for showing that is there's an understanding that we're entering a difficult time. Okay, a feeling for nature, but also this guy has a sense of humor. And my real worry is that most of the people who really worry about the ecology don't have a sense of humor. Okay, and without that, I don't think they're going to be very successful in many of their in an understanding of the problem. My real reason for being a scientist is it makes kids look as happy as this. Thank you very much.